and we are live. Fantastic, right. So um, I usually sort of wait for a few minutes just for the live to fill up. Um, so at the moment we've got about six people, um, but we usually hopefully get around 30 or more and then obviously it gets viewed after the fact as well. I can see Northern Aughty is on there, which is uh, my friend Simon. Hi, Simon. <laughs> oh, you can see who's watching? Uh, if I know them, it tells me that they've joined. Yeah. Ah. Um, and, and unless they comment, um, I don't tend to see. I'm trying to still learn about this stuff. So, hello, people filling up the room. Just waiting for a, a few people to join. And then I'll do some proper introductions. I'm hoping Harry's here. Might poke him just to make sure. Simon, would you mind actually um, messaging Harry and just seeing if he's coming on for the comment section? And Kirsty's here. Hello, Kirsty. Nine people. I say just wait for a little little number before I do some proper introdu introductions. Just me messaging myself as well. <laughs> So we've got 10 people. I'm waiting for it to tell me that Harry's here. Hi, people. So we've got, oh, Galadriel. Oh, lovely name. Uh, Ian. Hello, Ian. Oh, yeah. Galadriel's a friend of mine. Lovely name. So we've got 15 people. So I'll do, I'll do a quick introduction. Um, so in case anyone's new to Orcademy, I am Dr. Chloe Farahar, and Orcademy is an autistic um, education platform educating about all autistic experience from only autistic and or neurodivergent or otherwise neurodivergent educators. So today I am joined by Alyssa Hilary Zisk, and we are going to have um, a lovely half an hour um presentation from Alyssa. What is the title of your presentation? Um, I called it Augmentative and Alternative Communication and Autism. That is, says exactly what it is on the tin. Um, yeah, and then what we would really like is if you have any questions for Alyssa in relation to obviously what Alyssa talks about in their presentation, but also um, relating to the autistic need for alternate me means of communication. So if somebody's situation in mute, for instance, um, although I'm sure we can have those conversations as well about when, when alternate means of communication end up being needed and why I'd be quite interested in. Okay, let's just have a quick look. Okay, so hopefully Harry's here. He says he's here. Um, so Harry will be in the comments section, uh, keeping control of you lot in the comments. Um, and Harry, if you wouldn't mind, like the, the typical thing, oh, you recommend using gallery view. Thank you, Harry. Where's the... I can't see that, Harry. Well, I mean, I'm going to stop sharing my end in a minute anyway. I just wanted a good um, thumbnail. So Harry's just telling me to use gallery view, which I'll do when I change this over. Um, yeah, so Harry, if you could do what you probably normally do, which is pin any decent comments that we might miss um, or save the question somewhere so that I can ask them of Alyssa in the last half an hour. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to change it to, oh, it is on gallery view, Harry. Is it not working right? Yeah, I have got it on gallery view. Oh, well. Um, 
So yeah, I'm just going to hand it over to Alyssa. I'm actually going to turn my camera off and mute myself because then you won't get me popping up randomly while Alyssa's doing the presentation. So if you're okay to hand it over to you, that'd be great. Okay, I'm disappearing. All right, so my name is Alyssa, as stated, and I'm going to talk for about half an hour plus or minus, you know, precision is not necessarily perfect. Anyways, I am talking today about augmentative and alternative communication and autism. And my picture is rotated, oops. Anyways, I am an autistic doctoral candidate in interdisciplinary neuroscience at the University of Rhode Island. Um, I study brain computer interfaces officially. So I do research about disability and communication. In terms of today, that's going to be autism and augmentative and alternative communication for my dissertation, it's more directed at people with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Um, I personally use augmentative and alternative communication some of the time. The picture on the left side of the slide is rotated, but the text on the whiteboard reads, this is my most used communication board because at the time I took that picture, the whiteboard in a mathematics classroom was in fact my most used communication board. Uh, so first off, what is augmentative and alternative communication? It is a big umbrella term. It includes things like signed languages, not so much when it's used as a full language, but when people use signs to supplement speech, it includes facial expressions, it includes gestures that are not necessarily signs, it can include emojis, it can include texting and the use of the internet, it can include the use of dedicated communication devices or applications like the Dynavox, like Proloquo for text, like Flipwriter. Augmentative and alternative communication is really, really broad. The American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association, so wrong continent, I know, but they say it includes all of the ways we share our ideas and feelings without talking. We all use forms of AAC every day. You use AAC when you use facial expressions or gestures instead of talking. You use AAC when you write a note and pass it to a friend or coworker we may not realize how often we communicate without talking. So everyone uses AAC is the real answer, but in practice, we don't usually call it AAC unless somebody needs it for disability reasons. So when I say that I am a part-time AAC user, what I'm saying is that some of the time I am not able to speak and therefore use alternatives. Um, why might autistic people benefit from AAC? Some of us aren't able to speak at all. For those of us who can speak, our ability to speak can vary over time. We may have weeks, months, years when we are more or less able to rely on oral speech or we could lose speech, gain and lose speech rather rapidly over the course of minutes, seconds even sometimes. Our abilities can vary over time. Uh, between environments, this, is, this can fit with situational mutism or selective mutism, but it could also relate to environmental triggers such as if you flash strobes in my face, I am not going to be able to speak for much longer. That is an environmental difference that could be relevant to my need for AAC versus my ability to speak. 
other environmental features such as fluorescent lighting, such as background noise levels, such as scents, such as general level of stimulation in the environment may be relevant to other autistic people in the extent to which they can or cannot rely on speech at any given time and therefore do or do not require augmentative and alternative communication. Our speech abilities may vary between topics or types of communication. The more emotional content there is in what I am saying, the more likely it is that I will need to type in order to communicate effectively rather than using mouth words. The specific topic patterns may vary but the existence of this kind of pattern is fairly common among autistic people. It is not unusual for high emotional content to cause difficulties with speech. And it may be better for us to type for conversations that are high in emotional content. And between communication partners, if for example, I am in a situation where I can still speak somewhat, but my syntax is odd. A person who's accustomed to atypical syntax would still be able to understand me. I may choose to continue speaking. An unfamiliar communication partner is less likely to understand what I'm telling them, and I am more likely to switch to typing. Similarly, if syntax is becoming more atypical, I am more likely to switch to augmentative and alternative communication methods such as typing if I'm working with communication partners in a more professional environment. Because typing with atypical, typing with more typical language is a balancing act between with speech in less typical sounding speech, which one seems more professional, it's going to depend. Um, speech may vary. When you are considering the use of augmentative and alternative communication, there are several things to consider. One, portability. In different environments, you may have different needs for how portable your communication tools are. In my room, I can use my laptop because it's at my desk. I'm not needing to talk to people far away from my desk. Typing on it works. In a lab classroom, I am not going to carry my laptop to every single lab station that every single student is at in order to communicate with them when speech is not working for me. Instead, I will stick a bunch of index cards in my pockets, carry a pen, and handwrite. I'll leave my comments with the students. You'll need to think about how much portability matters to you and in what environments portability matters to you when deciding which augmentative and alternative communication tools you can use. Um, learnability, ease of use. Many people find icon-based AAC systems more efficient once they have learned how to use them because there are fewer button presses needed to communicate any particular word as long as they have the word programmed in. By using these icons in combination with a keyboard, they can communicate anything they want and things they have icons for are faster. However, I haven't done this because I'm not a super visual person and because I already know how to type pretty quickly. So balancing how easy it is to use once you've learned it versus how much effort it takes to learn it and what is and is not intuitive to you may be relevant in terms of um, what communication aids you choose to use. Most, many people who are already literate already know how to type in text. The learnability is right there. 
the question is whether or not this is the easiest thing to use in the long term. Uh, I just put up a bunch of things at once, privacy, visibility or marketedness, modality, community and audience. These have all gone up at once because I'm going to be giving them more attention on later slides. The final thing that I would talk about is control. This can be in terms of think parental controls, think in terms of who is making the decision. I am an adult. I make my own decisions about my own communication devices. Many applications are designed for SLPs or other clinicians to have some level of control over the device and the choices that are made regarding it. So when you're implementing a communication support, you want to think about who is in control of how this support works, who is making the decisions here. Ideally, it should be the person who's going to use this. So privacy. Augmentative and alternative communication systems typically have log files that represent the use of that system. Every button press is frequently recorded. This information is typically accessible to clinicians. They think of this as a good way to collect data. With consent, I agree that it can be. If you are not aware of this and agreeing to this, I consider it to be a massive privacy violation. So. Do you want something that has this kind of log file? Do you want to be able to turn it off? Who will you let look at it? Um, or this is now a screenshot of Proloquo for text on the health information. These are suggested saved texts. It is potentially useful for me to be able to save my diagnoses, my doctor's names, my insurance company, my insurance number, so that I can type them easily, share them easily, communicate them easily without needing to remember them all and type them all out again and again and again. For example, I don't actually know my doctor's number off the top of my head. However, the fact that these are suggested things to have saved and use does make a statement about what information we think people are going to save in on their iPhone or on their iPads. And that we just assume people are going to be willing to share on devices that frequently they are not the only person to access. Because I program my my own devices, I generally am the only person accessing them, but if I were not, I would be rather reluctant to put this information into my device. And in fact, even as the only person, I haven't. Um, and then again on privacy, can you turn a private mode on if you want to not log certain feature, certain if you want to not log what you're typing at any given time, I want that as an option if it's not the default. Um, visibility and markedness. On the left, I have Stephen Hawking with his wheelchair, with his communication device. He used switch access to control a computer, which he which then spoke for him. The, his communication aid is extremely obviously a communication aid. We can talk about whether that's something that's good, something that's a problem, something that you may or may not care about, but it is definitely a thing that is the case. When I use social media and type on social media, that's not marked as something that is inherently for a disability reason. People are not going to assume that I am tweeting because I cannot talk. People are not going to assume that I am texting on WeChat because I cannot talk. It may be the case that I'm doing these things because speech is not working, but that is not the assumption that people will generally make. 
using these options is not marked as being obviously about disability. So you need to decide when you're choosing your tools, do you care if you're using something that is obviously about disability or not? If you care, that does somewhat reduce your options. I use both kinds. And modality. Thing we, it is possible to sign, use signed languages. This is a primarily tactile modality. It is possible to use images as in the screenshot that I'm showing of, I believe it's Proloquo to go. I want waffles, please with icons for all of these. This can be useful for people who find it helpful to be able to hit a whole word in one keystroke and for people who find images easier to work with when overloaded. It's not about progressing from images to text. It's about choosing whichever combination of images and text works for you, which may vary over time. I pretty much just use text, but I am not visual, especially visual. I have no mind's eye. I'm hyperlexic. Text makes sense for me. Your mileage will probably vary. Uh, community and audience. This is a question of depending on what communication options you're using, are you going to find other people like you in this area, in this community, who use this communication option? Can you access communities of people like you using this communication op option? Can you access communities of people who may not be like you using this communication option? And your audience, who can you reach? I can reach a much greater audience on Twitter, tweeting to whoever's listening publicly than I can typing to the one person across from me using an application like Flipwriter. Sometimes I want to talk to one person. Sometimes I want to talk to the world. I use different communication options for these two situations you likely will too, most people do. Um, I have references because I am in fact an academic. If you want my references, I can share them with you. Second page of references. Yes, one of these on the second page, just like a couple on the first page are mine. I am an academic in addition to an autistic part-time AAC user. Um, thank you. I think I'm a little bit under half an hour, but I am going to open it up for questions because that is what I prepared. That was great, Alyssa. Thank you. Um, if you could stop sharing and then we'll be up on the screen. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah, there was already um, some a couple of comments and I've copied a question. Harry, if you see or saw any other questions that I might have missed, if you could pop them in WhatsApp for me. Um, let me bring up what I had in terms of questions, as well as some co um, just comments from whilst listening. Two seconds. Do, 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 do. Lovely. OK. Um, one of my comments was I hadn't even considered the privacy issue. And that's that's really interesting because I didn't well, I just didn't think about it, to be honest, that some of those devices would obviously have logs that other people may be able to access. And I think that in, of it, in, in and of itself is quite interesting because why wouldn't a disabled person or somebody you know if they don't consider themselves disabled but doesn't you know doesn't use um oral communication why wouldn't they want privacy for their conversations like every other person so yeah i found that really interesting how that wouldn't be a clear ethical issue 
Um, yeah. So uh, it it is an ethical issue because um, let's say a disabled person who uses AAC all the time needs to say report abuse possibly by the clinician or caretaker who accesses the log. Yeah. Yeah, no, you really need to be able to turn that off. I, yeah, it's, it's really bizarre, the fact that I would just assume, like any other conversation you have, you would have an element of privacy. So yeah, that's quite, it's quite a worrying thing. And, and what if you don't have the ability to switch it on or off yourself? And how would you ask if, like you say, it, it's concerned for the, the if, you, if it's a carer, for instance, would they be happy to or willing to turn that privacy if there's a setting on or off? Interesting. OK, um, I've got a comment that I noted from Susie Davey. Are you also looking at the comment section? I am. I if it's the one about asking about communication options um interested in a small icon based something oh oops i missed the icons part um i'm not as familiar with icon based things because i use text but proloquo to go lamp words for life speak my mind i think might have something there are a lot of icon based AAC apps and some of them have sales this month. You're doing the same as me, aren't you? You're looking at the comment section to see what questions might have come up. <laughs> Who, me? Yeah, I was wondering if you're doing the same as me. Yeah. So we've got a pinned comment from Susie Davey. Um, and you've answered the one that I've mentioned. So Susie just saying uh, he reads above age level, he's nine. So is this icons text or either, either or? Um, I mean, I've got, cause obviously I've got the links that you sent me as well as I've posted uh, the link to the open access paper that you had. Do any of the links that you gave me that I can give to the learners list potential software or devices or, th or things so that they can look into that? My links do not, but I have some idea where I could find such links. Um, AAC sales October. October means AAC sales. That's potentially relevant. Lovely. So if you actually copy and paste that, if you can, if you don't mind, into the chat um, section, that'd be great. Um, I may have just put it into the Facebook comment section. That's great. Lovely. Thank you. And then what I might do is ask for, oh, you put them in here, but that's fine. I, can... I did both. <laughs> ah, lovely. OK. Um, and what I'm thinking is, so your um, lovely list of references at the end, if you could actually send that to me just plain word document or even just in email or something I've got a note section on our Facebook page for people so they can actually find reading lists for things um if you wouldn't mind us having the reading list that you all the references that you had that'd be really good for people um so Ian's also asking how might alternate and augmented communication tools be used to help mitigate the slower processing times that autistic people have, especially in conversation with neurotypicals? So for those who aren't perhaps aware, neurotypical meaning non-autistic or any other form of neurodevelopmental difference. All right, so most people type more slowly than they talk if you are typing rather than speaking this can build that slight slowdown into the conversation but i don't think that it will undo the slower processing times if you have those 
it more builds that extra time into the conversation already. I'm not totally sure if there are tools that would specifically be built to address different processing times. So I've got a few questions of my own. We might not get through all of them if other people have got any other questions as well, but these are just things that I was quite interested um, interested in, sorry. And so I don't know whether you've answered this per se, but I, my, one of my questions, what's the nature of your communication? So it, do you consider, is it like autistic situational mutism? Um, and what does it feel like when you're unable to use, I like your phrase, which is mouth words, because usually I would say orally verbalized, but I love mouth words actually, the way you um, describe it. So yeah, what is the nature of your communication differences if you're able to explain that? Yeah, so sometimes I can speak and sometimes my speech sounds fairly typical, fluent if odd. Sometimes I cannot speak with my mouth at all. And sometimes I can use mouth words, but it is a lot of effort, even more than usual. And I may lose my track of what I'm doing mid sentence, or only be able to get a word out at a time, or be able to respond, but not initiate. These are all ways that my communication could go a little bit wonky. Situational mutism, I don't know if that's a specific diagnosis or not. If it's analogous to selective mutism. In it is, sorry, we, we tend to use situational over selective because selective sounds uh, voluntary. Yeah. So we tend to, yeah. Okay, in that case, that is not actually what I have. I went through, I may have gone through the DSM with a counselor that I was seeing at the time. And while I do have anxiety, I do not have selective or situational mutism. It is not really correlate, my ability to speak is not really correlated with my anxiety. And it is, not consistent within any given environment. It relates more to my energy levels than anything else. So it's totally an autistic thing. It's reported and described by lots of autistic people who are typically considered speaking, but it is not situational mutism. And that's why I find it interesting, because obviously there's different reasons why a lot of us as autistic people might, you know, for me, for me, for instance, I don't experience situational mutism and I don't feel that I experience what you experience, although I'd like to, if you're able to understand a little bit more what it's like or what it feels like almost, but I do experience difficulty getting my words out and um, sometimes I will really slow down in terms of how I'm talking because I'm really struggling energy wise. Um, but I don't say that I don't think I experience situational mutism. It's not like I say, it's not related to anxiety. It's usually related to executive functioning issues for me. So are you able to describe what it's like when you're not, not able to use mouth words? Just being unable to use mouth words doesn't feel like much, but if I can't use mouth words and I'm trying to anyways, it is extremely stressful and I will feel like I can't come up with the right words, whereas if I start typing, all of a sudden I have all the words. Hmm, maybe speech is the problem. <laughs> And because we did um, uh, a session a few weeks back with Harry, Kieran Rose, and, oh no, Senka, um, who all experience situational mutism. And when they experience it, it can be obviously anxiety related, that kind of thing, but also um, 
I, I hear a lot with people with situational mutism talking about the mechanics, like they physically cannot make the words form in their mouths kind of thing. So yeah, it's just really interesting to hear the differences in, in how we may um, have different modes of uh, communication or struggle to communicate. Um, so for instance, if you don't mind, can you tell me why when we met a few weeks back, you at that point needed to use alternate means of communication for me and Harry. And I was deeply, I was kind of excited because I was like, this is great. I, I knew that you were, obviously I'd approached you because I really wanted to have somebody come on to discuss this topic, but I hadn't realized that you yourself also would have needed alternate means of communication. So I was like, this is amazing. You've actually got somebody who can talk about it from a first person perspective. So at that point, was that energy? issues you'd have needed to have asked me then i don't remember it happens often enough uh last night when i was talking to chloe uh not chloe you're chloe how do <laughs> words when i was talking to lydia on click speak connect also about augmentative and alternative communication i needed to type last night because we'd had a fire drill earlier in the day <laughs> and that knocked speech out. Um, so you mentioned, so I did have a question that was, is there a diagnosis for your particular difficulties at times to communicate using math words? But you said you'd kind of gone through the DSM with a counselor and Although you couldn't see it as selective mutism, you didn't necessarily, did you see anything else? I mean, we're not very, on Academy, we're actually not about pathologizing at all, but we just wondered if there was a particular. There is not. There needs to be better understanding of how inconsistent, unreliable, insufficient speech can work for autistic people, but there is not a specific diagnosis or sub-diagnosis to describe having that happen. I suspect that at least one of those applies to most autistic people at some times. One of my questions is also, that it's actually something I think Harry was interested in is, is it frustrating? But on the flip side, is it also liberating to have to use alternate means? Using alternative means when necessary is extremely liberating because it means that I can, you know, go to the improv show perform in the improv show, teach, go places, do whatever I want without needing to worry about whether or not speech is working at the time or will be working at the time. Other people's reactions to my need for AAC can occasionally be frustrating because people frequently just don't know what to do or assume that it requires pity, which no, no, it does not. But the experience itself, no, it's just a thing that happens. Uh, I've got a question, which is, what would you want people to know about non-traditional non communicators? We're a big ass group <laughs> that of um, people who vary a lot. Exactly what we need and what we prefer when communicating with us will vary. Ask the person. Thank you. That's actually in and of itself is quite important that there's a large number of people who may not always use or ever use traditional communication. Um, and something I was asking you earlier on was how does your university and your supervisors, for instance, accommodate you? Fun fact, I am the first person at the University of Rhode Island to get part-time AAC use as a formal accommodation 
they obviously couldn't tell me that, but I could deduce it from the fact that I watched them put my accommodation into the system. Whereas other accommodations people have had before were already in the system and they were able to cut workshop and customize my wording such that it's now on its third revision of the wording. I think that third revision is probably my final wording. Um, what I get is that I am entitled to use alternative methods of communication as needed for any given class environment supervisor we're going to have a conversation about what methods work for me and which of those are likely to be best suited to the environment that I'll be working with them in. This has meant I lay claim to the one seat in the classroom that is within reach of a side whiteboard and scribble on it. It has meant I've used text to speech. It has meant that I've used the chat function in Zoom meetings. It varies because environments vary. And can I ask, do you know any sign, for instance? Is that something that you use or want to use? I've thought about learning it, but I do not at this time know sign. I do not know any signed language, to be clear. Um, not ASL, not signed exactly English, not BSL. Although I guess you'd have to have enough people around you to know it, to be able to communicate with them with that method. That anyway. too. Yeah, so I guess, like say, if it's text-based, then hopefully the majority of people will be able to communicate with you in that way, or at least understand your communication in that from that mode. Um, and I asked you earlier on as well, before we came on, which was how do your students react to you using alternate means of communication? It varies. As a teacher, I present it like it's just totally normal, by which I mean, I don't really present it. I just, if it's needed, I pull it out and start using it. It's not something that requires comment. Most students follow my lead and do not comment. I have had a couple of students ask, which was fine and I had one student really want to tell me that it was so sad that I couldn't speak at the time which was awkward mm -hmm. because I was really just trying to tell her to fix how to fix her electronics circuit and it's still yeah it's interesting isn't it because it is I say just communication, but it is just communication. So why would they need to feel, like you said earlier on, you not to pity people because of their alternate means of communication? Um, and I, I mentioned before we came on, um, like I say, I know a number of autistic students who are situationally mute. Um, and regardless of who, what students I have, and obviously everything's online at the moment, um, I talk, tell all my students, regardless of whether they've got an inclusive learning plan, which might be called something different, dependent on your university and country, I imagine. Um, so your, your accommodation needs, is that listed on a type of plan? What's it called in the state? So at the K through 12 level, students in the United States can have either 504 plans or individualized educational programs which is frequently abbreviated as IEP. Okay, yeah, so probably they call them RILP. Yeah, at the university level, the methods vary somewhat, but what is typical is that there'll be some sort of accommodations office that you meet with and they determine what accommodations you get. They have a letter that they issue that either they'll send to your professors or you'll send to your professors 
you're supposed to meet with your professors about said accommodations. It's logistically a pain and does not play nice with executive dysfunction, but it does exist. You frequently need to have a new meeting every semester to confirm that you do in fact still need accommodations and that they have not changed. That sounds like a lot of work for a disabled student. I mean, I get frustrated sometimes with some of the process that has to go on in my university, but typically it is sort of, unless your circumstances change, you have an inclusive learning plan, unless you ask them to update it. It's not necessarily that you have to keep going back to demonstrate your disability or need. I forget forget to ask actually, what year of your um, PhD are you at? And is it is it a three year, four year? How does it work for you? Because my funding has generally been from being a teaching assistant rather than being like for my research, I don't think I have the same level of it's a set amount of time. I am in my fifth year and this is hopefully my last year. Ideally, I will be graduating in May. Fantastic. Um, yeah, because I forgot to ask that. Um, but my, my, my final point I was saying about, um, yeah, with my students is regardless of whether they have an ILP, so an inclusive learning plan, whether they are neurodivergent or neurotypical, all my students are allowed to have audio off, cameras off, and just use the chat function if they want to, because I'm aware that there will be situationally mute students, there'll be those that are very anxious, um, and, and a whole other host of reasons. So I think it's important to just normalize the different ways that people can and have to communicate sometimes or all the time. Um, And I also have, which I'm really sad because at the moment, because we're having to teach so much online, but I don't get to teach offline. I do miss it. Um, And I think I've mentioned before on here that I have participation cards for all my students. So, and I've done that for over a year, which is where every student has to pick a card and the first card that they can pick, or one of the cards rather, is uh, please include me today. The others are uh, table discussion only, um, just listening today, or alternate means of communication. And I remember very the first time I introduced my new students to this card system, and this, there was a small number that said, well, I'll always participate, so do I have to get a card? And I was like, yes, for lots of reasons. You normalise it for everybody who wants to pick up a card. And also, I then know that I'm okay to approach you if I have a question, whereas it protects the other students who perhaps want that. Just that little card is enough of a barrier to say, okay, I'm not prepared to talk today, um, and so on and so forth. Although, like I said, it is um, trying to get my school to understand at the university um, how useful those cards actually are for you as a teacher, not just for the students has been interesting because they were worried it meant that some students would never ever participate because they get to sort of a, a free pass almost. And I said, you just don't find that. I've been doing it with five seminar groups, which is 80 students. And even the students to pick up the card that says just listening today, sometimes they still participate, but that card gives them the opportunity to say, no, I pass on this discussion or something. It just gives yeah. them that sort of safety blanket. Do you have students who pick that regularly or consistently, or is it just it happens sometimes? Largely, I would have had a small, very, very small number across my 80 students um, who would pick up the Just Listening Today card regularly. But even those students would still make the decision on occasion to contribute. But like I say, all it did was give them that breathing space to make it their decision. Um, So, yeah, and I just did not see the issue. um, To be honest, even if they didn't participate every any at any point, I still think that's okay. Um, I know that's not acceptable to a lot of universities because they expect a certain type of participation. But to me, turning up to class and not speaking or or contributing or participating in any way is still participation to me because they're still there. 
They are. And they're still listening. Exactly. We just need to normalise this stuff. Um, yeah. Um, and I've popped your article um, up as well. Um, so that which is great because it's open access. Um, so sometimes it's quite hard for people who don't have um, a university library account, for instance, to access those papers. So why that particular paper? Um, because it's accessible or because it's your latest or it kind of gives you a really good overview? It's actually not my latest paper. Um, it's about a year and a half old at this point, and I have more recent work on augmentative and alternative communication. But what it is, is a good overview of why, of why autistic people may benefit from augmentative and alternative communication, even if they can speak what barriers we may face in utilizing these communication tools, um, what we meant, what tools we managed to use, and questions that require further research, of which there are a lot, because honestly, research on communication supports for autistic people tends towards being for young children, for people who don't speak at all, or directed at trying to get us to communicate as superficially similarly to neurotypicals as possible, none of which AAC for speaking autistic adults fits under. just check in because harry's told me there's a couple of questions that i might have missed in the comment section so i feel like have you answered a number already Alyssa, or should i ask harry to make um accessible? i've replied to a couple just by typing back but i have no real memory of which ones i may have addressed in mouth words yeah, I think largely you, you've answered my questions, which has been really, oh, what's Harry's given me? Oh, okay, so Harry says, uh, posting for Susie, Susie Davey, saying, totally agree, I'm NT, so neurotypical, and the only autistic I communicate really well with is my son, saying that the only neurotypical kid I totally understand all commun communication with is my Neurotyp sorry, saying that, the only neurotypical kid I totally understand or communication with is my neurotypical son. Maybe then there's often an element of miscommunication, but it is multiplied tenfold when you communicate between ND and NT. Um, I mean, we can really very briefly touch on, yes, that is typically the case, Susie, which Short is the double empathy problem. Short answer, yes. Um, you can talk about it in terms of double empathy. You can talk about it in terms of theory of whose mind, which is what I often ask. You can talk about it in terms of similarities to cross-cultural communication, which I have a chapter about, which I referenced in the thread that comment is from. Fantastic. But yeah, and that, if you already have alternate, you know, alternate means of communicating, and also you're trying to um, have a communi communicate, sorry, cross neurotype, so between neurodivergent and neurotypical, then there will be some element of lost in translation. Um, so even for autistic individuals who do use mouth words, I do love this friend. Um, so who do use mouth, mouth words, um, typically between autistic people communication is not necessarily easier per se but it's better understood and more easily and readily understood than between a neurotypical and a neurodivergent a i.e autistic and non-autistic person more efficient information transfer within neurotype than across neurotype I believe I saw that paper. I don't know the reference offhand. It's, uh, yeah, it's Crompton. It's a very good paper. So um, Alyssa is absolutely right. So fantastic paper by, 
I always forget first names because you only ever, when you're an academic, you just see surnames all the time. Um, so apologies, but it is Crompton, um, the paper. Um, I did check with them to see if they could come on, but they're not neurodivergent and we, we don't um, allow neurotypical people on academy at present. Um, what else? Has neener, neener. <laughs> Basically, yes, this is a platform purely for autistic and otherwise neurodivergent people. Um, Simon asks, how can different forms of communication work on the phone for conversations? Because, and I know Simon, so I know that he really struggles uh, and a lot of autistic people struggle with phone conversations in general. Um, and he says, especially with official or government bodies, because I know he struggles to talk to people on the phone. So. Any alternate means of communication you can use in that situation? Honestly, when I need to make an appointment with my doctor and they don't do online booking, I physically go there and okay. talk to the person who is physically at the desk to make that appointment. Yeah, and we're going to really struggle with that. Like I say, I know Simon and, and I know that there would be some difficulty there. I think I'm right saying that, honor Simon, to actually turn up, especially in the UK with how um, physical distance is, is. So, for instance, the GPs, uh, uh, doctors, you really can't just turn up. Yeah, no, I, I have not done that since physical distancing began mm -hmm. but what that largely means is I have seen the medical professionals I can make appointments with over the internet and the others I have not that is a very frustrating one Simon and I for other I mean I don't like talking on the phone much either unless it's somebody I know and I'm happy to talk to them and even then it has to be on my terms I don't like being called out of the blue um if I'm not expecting it but I have on occasion rung GPs and things on behalf of say a student who's autistic and really struggles with the phone um to try and support them um I had a train of thought and I've lost it been building um, cabinets and things today for Harry. So my spoons are running a little bit low at this time of night. Um, ah, I know what I was gonna say. Yes, in terms of phone calls, even if you aren't somebody who regularly needs alternate means of communication, um, phones are so difficult for autistic people for a number of reasons. And we should be having on, I think next week, I'll have to check the calendar, but Mary Doherty, so Dr. Mary Doherty, autistic, um, who will be coming on to discuss one of the, well, the num numerous barriers to healthcare for autistic people. And actually one of the biggest barriers for us is using the phone to make appointments. Um, not any other health related thing other than picking up a phone can actually really impact our health because we we really struggle to make those phone calls and like I say everything should be online right now I should be able to make my GP appointment online I, I don't need to talk to somebody <laughs> um yeah um I've got another question from Susie Davey or comment so have thought about signing with my son do you think sign would feel comfortable Thinking my son would need his stim space and signing would be in the way. I think he may prefer to watch sign instead of hearing mouth words sometimes. Um, and they just love how this is making them think more broadly. So you've given them that today as well. I'm so glad that you've been thinking more broadly. Those are very much questions you'll need to ask your son. I can tell you that signed languages work for many autistic people, but it's not all, and he may or may not be interested. And I can't remember how old Susie said their son was. I think well, they said nine. they're nine, yeah. Um, it's a Makaton, which is a basic form of sign, as I understand it. I don't know if that would be too basic for a nine-year-old I really don't know enough about Makaton I'm afraid I know Jessica does our um uh, admin manager 
um, I've said it for a few years now that I would really like to learn um, BSL, so British Sign Language, um, for numerous reasons. I'd like it so that a number of the students I support, if we actually learnt it as um, a group, like say, because there are a number who are situationally mute, um, and for instances where, for instance, I go out with my partner, not so much now, but pre-lockdown, um, and he really, really struggles because he's autistic and ADHD in loud spaces. So if we go to a restaurant and it's incredibly loud, but we don't want to leave, we both put in music and share the music so that we're still connecting, but there's, there's no way at that point really to communicate whilst you're eating your dinner, that kind of thing. So in those instances where he's really overwhelmed, you know, sign would be so useful. So I think it is something I'm gonna, me personally, if there's enough of me, not enough of us, sorry, around in terms of people I support or friends, then I think it would be useful. Oh yeah, Susie was just confirming that they're nine. Okay, so it's just gone nine. So um, if anyone's got any final questions or comments, if you could pop them in now, um, otherwise we will start to wrap up. Unless Alyssa, you've got any points or comments or questions actually? Um, a cup, somebody about my using AAC in the classroom. So I'll throw a link to the chapter about that into chat. But I think that covers things for me. Yeah, this is, I was really, I've been really looking forward to this one. So it's been really good. And you've definitely, this is what I really love doing on Academy because people will ask about topics or me and Harry will be, um, I or Harry, I or Harry? Spoons, lone spoons. Um, you know, we'll talk about something and we'll go, oh, we don't know enough about that. Let's go and find somebody, an autistic educator of any description to come and talk about that thing. So we get to learn about it too. Um, and we're learning so many new areas from doing this. It's been really good. Um, so we're just seeing if there's any comments, just giving people some time. So like I said, I'm pretty sure, let me check our events that it is, Hopefully, Mary Doherty next week on healthcare barriers when autistic. So that's next week. Um, as always, if anyone is able to donate a pound um, for our speakers so that we can pay our speakers for their time, that would be really appreciated. Um, your comments are always useful as well when you're um, coming to participate with us, which is great. Oh, sorry, just looking at the comments. It is Harry or I. Okay, thanks, Harry. I know I get to a point where I'm like, I really don't know. Uh, fetch a spoon for the potato. Oh, okay, they're, they're now playing on the joke that I call myself Dr. Potato sometimes. Well, I actually just say I'm a potato and then Harry changed it to Dr. Potato. <laughs> well, if you have a PhD. Yes. And I call myself a potato because of the shaved head. Um, so then Harry started with the Dr. Potato thing. Um, Let's have a look. Da, 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 da. Okay, so people just having some comments, I think, about the healthcare barriers and phone and what have you. Thank you for my time. Um, Susie's asking, does Chloe like chips? <laughs> what is it? I do like chips. I'm not actually a potato. <laughs> oh dear. Um, yeah, so yeah, so thank you so much, Alyssa. You've been really, really useful in helping me understand this a bit better. Um, if anyone's got any other questions for Alyssa, you're welcome to pop them on Facebook and we can get them over to Alyssa. And I will try and get the read the references that you had because people might be interested in those. So I tend to put them in the notes um, on our page. So yeah, otherwise, thanks so much, Alyssa. But you're welcome to stay on here while I shut down live. Um, and I think that's everybody's questions. It is. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody.